I'm, going, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Nate Osgood, Assistant Professor of the Department of Computer Science, University of Saskatchewan, and the Associate Faculty of the School of Public Health, Department of Community Health, and Epidemiology. Thank you very much, Vahid. It's my great pleasure to be here today, and I want to uh, especially thank the uh, symposium organizers, um, particularly Vahid, for his, uh, for his invitation and the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, uh, well, uh, with most of my talks, I focus on um, our research results, particularly our quantitative modeling in the area of public health. Um, I thought I'd step a bit back from, um, from that work to reflect on a set of uh, what I believe to be important gaps that currently obtain between our aspirations and applying simulation models in, in public health in the reality of the situation. Now, um, these gaps that I've identified are what I believe are, are less articulated um, gaps, which uh, have not been widely discussed, but which I, I think are really um, merit substantive thinking. And I'm hoping that by, by raising them, we can advance some of the discussion um, of those gaps and work towards a situation where dynamic modeling in this area can live up to its full potential. I think we have a there are ways to go to there, but um, I, I think an important first step for many of these issues is, is just laying them to bear. And it's with that um, perspective that I put together this talk. The motivations for this talk, and indeed for, for my work in this area, lie in the fact that um, uh, decision making in public health is, is, is a complex task. Um, within public health, as my colleague Bobby Milstein puts it, we are seeking to redirect the course of change. Um, as an example of this, I would, uh, I would refer people to the uh, alarming rise in uh, heart disease mortality rates, uh, which obtained uh, through the 1960s, which really brought a lot of attention and concern to uh, the rising burden of, of chronic disease within the population. What we saw is, is really sharply increasing rates, which if projected out, would have led to remarkably high rates and what is already the number one cause of death in the states, um, yielding uh, rates that are uh, many times higher yet. And through the dint of really extensive public health efforts, uh, efforts focused uh, in a variety of uh, points along the spectrum at multiple points of the clinical progression of patients, screening and prevention, um, aimed at uh, reducing the burden of smoking, which was recognized in, in the late 60s, particularly in the Surgeon, General, Surgeon General's report as a major driver of heart disease, and uh, making better use of health utilization, the burden of, of heart disease mortality was, was brought down. Treatment, uh, improvements in treatment had a lot to do with that as well. And it was really through this uh, mobilization of, of efforts along a broad variety of factors that we were able to turn the situation around. There's a lot of situations which aren't so rosy in their, their outlook. Um, this slide here shows uh, chlamydia rates, the number one reportable uh, illness within Canada. Um, and it shows their changes over a period in the early 1990s. And what you'll see is through, uh, through dint of really extensive public health effort, uh, aggressive contact tracing, screening, um, public advisors, et cetera, a lowering of the chlamydia burden within the population. What has happened next, though, is less encouraging. Um, despite those efforts remaining in place and uh, despite refinements in public health strategies, there's been a uh, a real rise in the number of reported cases of sexually transmitted chlamydia uh, within Canada. And this is a trend that's been seen uh, in the States as well, but also in many countries in Northern Europe. So it's, it's a trend of considerable concern and um, to the point where many people are, are labeling it a crisis. This is a textured issue, but it reflects the fact that when we're dealing with, uh, with public health and, and decision-making public health, we're fundamentally dealing with uh, all the hallmarks of a, of a classic complex system so with delays, nonlinearity, feedbacks, tremendous heterogeneity. And these complexities are not merely intellectual uh, curiosities. They have a first order bearing on the efficacy of different interventions aimed at redirecting this course of change. 
we need to take into account a lot of these complexities to understand the trade-offs between different interventions, whether to intervene upstream or downstream or some combination thereof. The degree to which we put our, our emphasis on uh, prevention or uh, looking at screening mechanisms, uh, aggressive targeted contact tracing or, or broader mechanisms. Our choice between these um, choices between these will be shaped in very important ways by an understanding of the complexities because those, imp those complexities have huge implications for the uh, efficacy of different interventions. Now, dynamic models, and I include in that sort of classic uh, mathematical epidemiology as well as uh, si the use of simulation models in their varied forms, have a really important role to play. Uh, um, I have a I have a conviction of that, and um, they proved much of their worth within this area. These models, as many of people in here will appreciate, have many virtues to recommend them. Um, the one that's, uh, that's attracted the most interest is, of course, their, their potential for serving as what-if tools, tools to evaluate interventions and understand their trade-offs. And it was with that one in mind that I put together those previous slides. However, these models have many other uh, potential benefits to bring to bear. Perhaps the most basic and, and most fundamental have to do with the fact that they make explicit our mental models of how a system works. Our understanding allow us to posit dynamic hypotheses by which we can reason about possible explanations for the patterns that we see. And by making those explicit and placing them into the community of ideas, we can critique those we can refine them, and we can build the top of them. Models have many other advantages for helping prioritize data collection as communication vehicles as well. So they, they serve many purposes at the table. The grim truth, though, as, as far as um, my 10-year experience within applying these dynamic models to public health suggests, is that we're quite some distance away from being able to realize the full potential of these models, along many of the, the points just mentioned. Um, I think recognizing this, and, and more particularly recognizing the barriers, is, is really important. Many of the challenges, I think, are, are poorly articulated, are um, not are sort of, uh, the sort of thing we come up with and recognize through modeling experience, but not widely talked about. I think it's important both to manage expectations and to articulate these challenges so we can better understand them and so that we can work to, um, to overcome them. So it was with that in mind that I put together uh, some thoughts on 10 uncomfortable truths in this area. Uncomfortable and less widely articulated. Given the audience here and the balance of some of the wonderful presentations we heard earlier, um, a few of these let, uh, need less uh, discussion, but I think many of them may be, may be new to people who are from outside the applications in public health to hear how these impact um, some, of the, uh, some of the work there. I might, rec I might note here that uh, a number of these areas, which are starred, um, indicate areas that are addressed by our work at the University of Saskatchewan. So there's a a number of these areas in which we have active work, and I'll try to give a nod to that work in the course of this talk without um, drawing attention from other worthy work that goes on in these areas. So the first truth um, is that many models uh, within this area are really too narrow to yield reliable guidance to uh, public health decision making. Um, there's a, a real um, growth in the number of contributions in this area, use of dynamic models. But many of them, through uh, expedience, the desire to build models that, that quickly address uh, challenges, um, and, and try to inform a uh, policy discussion are awfully narrow. And they end up leaving out a lot of factors. The focus is in many ways um, centered on prevention analysis, analysis and forecasting, which I think mean, can really underplay some of the some of the obstacles we learned from Europe. And what you see is that a lot of this area, while it's widely recognized that it could have been also pulled a broader set of factors, such as these notes here. They're traditionally really well a lot of the models. You know, the classic example is going to be some mathematical methodology where um, um, the, the, the complexity of the models is limited by the analytic analysis, analysis the analytic approaches which are used to understand the analytic models. But it's a, it's a trend that we see in other areas as well. I think uh, there's a real need within this area to recognize 
recognize and how to stress uh, basic research. Such as the work that we talked about this morning, which is somewhat of a more qualitative or, or educational flavor to it, in, in the public health um, uh, arena. And, and really elevating the uh, recognized importance of learning oriented models. I think conferences and venues like this one, um, which, are, which bring together people from a wide variety of backgrounds, and particularly those from the social and behavioral sciences, can be very, very valuable. I know there's a lot of uh, impetus towards this in the states right now through sponsorship from NIH. And I think uh, it promises to, um, to enhance efforts in these areas. Broader teams are needed. I've heard uh, some people in the mathematical epidemiology area whose opinions I value very, very highly for their work in dynamic modeling um, completely write off incorporating these broader factors because they said, well, you know, we'd have to start talking to sociologists and, you know, start talking to people in psychology. And by implication, we can't do that. You know, that's outside our ken. Well, it needs to be our can if we need to address these substantive issues. And finally, I think speaking truth to those in power. It's, it's awful easy to give a very narrow model to someone and say, look, these are the questions we can address in the what-if analyses. But the truth is, it may be a false precision. We may be able to give precise answers that are inaccurate. And um, we need to be able to, uh, to warn people in terms of the proper use of models, there's models which are more geared to learning, and there's models which um, are only later made, can make possible really serious leveraging of real insights into policy trade-offs. A related issue has to do with interventions and the representation of those interventions in the model. Almost all models that I've encountered within the public health arena that represent behavior in the model do so by representing that behavior exogenously. And what I mean by that is the behaviors that are, are incorporated in the model are not emergent properties of the model in terms of their dynamics. They're hard-coded in by the modeler. So to investigate a particular intervention, that modeler will put into place certain assumptions about how it changes those behaviors and hard-code those into the analysis. Now, models of this sort offer great advantages nonetheless. They allow us to understand how these behavioral changes, as hard-coded, impact more distal things upstream and downstream in, in um, the, uh, the health system more broadly. So how do they impact public health downstream? However, what they do not help us understand is the counterintuitive behavioral impacts that can sometimes be generated by the use of certain interventions. And I put up as an example here um, uh, some of the many cases which are historically um, known in which particular interventions, well thought through, well intentioned, were put into place and triggered counterintuitive, unanticipated behavioral feedbacks that lessened the efficacy of those interventions within the population and sometimes led to net, net negative results. And models in which we hard code our assumptions about behavioral change that come about as a result of an intervention don't allow us the level of granularity to understand these, these effects, to capture them and use them when we, when we um, uh, bear in mind the trade-offs between different models. So I think there's a real potential here for building models which are broader in terms of their representation of behavioral change. There's uh, a variety of techniques, um, discrete choice theory I'll, I'll uh, characterize importantly, by which we, I think we can um, incorporate some elements and work towards a, a richer, uh, more psychologically based models of, of human functioning within the public health arena. And um, I think there's a fair bit of work to be done, but such models would allow us to incorporate, say, the uh, and anticipate the effects of price changes, of tax burden, of various incentives put into place, potentially new laws, as they ripple through to impact public health, and as they, as, uh, they might yield counterintuitive behavioral uh, changes. A third uncomfortable truth has to do with uh, the diversity of modeling approaches uh, available. I've included here on this slide just one taxonomy that, that could be used to divide the types of models which are applied. There's many others, aggregate versus individual-based models. Having worked a lot on both these sides, individual-based, a lot of agent-based modeling, aggregate models, a variety of types, what I can say is that 
In all these cases, I found really substantive barriers. I don't have time to go into, but they're textured barriers um, that are different between these two approaches for um, gaining insight into important public health uh, problems. These barriers include performance issues, but they also include issues having to do with other stages of the modeling process. Validation, calibration, agent-based models, a uh, significant issue because of uh, the uh, underdetermined nature of uh, a lot of the calibration challenges. Um, uh, issues having to do with the need to represent fine grain interventions, scaling with heterogeneity or scaling with the population size, et cetera. Um, Suffice it to say, I think multi-framework modeling, cases where a single project incorporates several types of modeling within the project that either co-evolve so that one model informs and helps cross-validate the other, or cases where we have multi-scale models where a single model may incorporate several modeling types at different scales can offer a lot of value. The final thing, which I find uh, sort of overlooked by a lot of my dynamic modeling colleagues in public health is the fact that the models that we use there, simulation models, can work extremely well with other types of traditional models within, that are widely used within public health, such as the use of decision trees. And the integrations that can be allowed are sometimes very, very powerful. And I think it's, it's, it's an odd thing that there's, uh, there hasn't been greater uh, um, number of models which have taken advantage. Another... Um, shortcoming that uh, I'll mention, um, something I think we can overcome, is the fact that specification mechanisms as currently used, and I'll single out some agent-based models in public health for this, uh, for this comment, are gratuitously opaque. It's not simply agent-based models, but certainly you see the issue there. Cases where models have, you know, the C++ code describing them used as not only it to implement the model, but as a specification mechanism. And it tends not to work very well as a communication vehicle, as was noted, to other stakeholders. There's, um, as a result of uh, a failure to, to allow for the separation of concerns, separating the specification from the implementation of a model, um, a failure to separate the what from the how, as it were, that the model um, describes. Uh, we have risks of errors. Um, we make the model less accessible, difficult to understand, reproduce, and build at top. And I think there's some really good opportunities, speaking as a computer scientist, for bringing to bear um, advances in language technology, the use of declarative mechanisms, the use of domain-specific languages within the public health dynamic modeling area to help lower the risk of errors, make models more transparent, and um, more easily uh, communicated. Um, fifth. Fifth issue is the fact that, um, that while I consider myself and, and most people working in this area who consider some, themselves first and foremost to have a core competency in modeling, the, the sad truth of the matter is I probably spend 70 to 80 percent of my time gathering data or working with data, massaging data to get it into the model, trying to back calculate from the data that's available to the quantities in the model, trying to scout what data is available. It's a variety of, of reasons um, in, involved in calibration where uh, we spend an inordinate amount of time within our models. And there's broad categories of, of, of our domain where we'd really like to have certain types of data, social networks in the context of chronic disease, something we were just talking about, where there's really no good data available. The time spent here is not merely a nuisance. It takes away our time from understanding the models better and refining the models. So it has a big opportunity cost. And I think there's a, there's a substantive opportunity here for modelers to collaborate with those responsible for data collection to both inform the data collection process with understanding of the, the, the uh, high priority items for, for uh, collection by understanding which items tend to bear on, on intervention trade-offs, but as well to partner with those people so that the data that's collected at least avoids gratuitous mismatch with modeling needs so that we can understand the impact of an intervention on behavior so that we collect information through cross-sectional uh, cross surveillance instruments that can better inform dynamic models. Um, these things are possible, and I think we, need, we as modelers need to avoid the model where we simply... Uh, get things thrown over the fence to us in the form of data and take a more proactive role in working with those on the data collection side. 
There's really big opportunities here. I think the use of public health observatories with richly cross-linked data, um, identification algorithms for cases and, and cross-linking have a lot of opportunities. And something that, in addition to our work um, just emerging in that, the use of um, electronic um, ambulatory assessments through techniques, uh, through devices such as the iPhone, which are being carried for other reasons, can really help inform an understanding of health trajectories as well as the social context of, of behavior. And finally, I'll mention user-contributed metadata in a world of Web 2.0. The opportunity for leveraging broad communities' insights and annotations on data is something that's been widely used within the bioinformatics area and I think can offer some real some real opportunities here. Another point is the fact that the modeling process right now is awfully entropic. What do I mean by that? We produce massive numbers of documents and related pieces of data. We define versions of models that are successively refined. We create scenarios that we investigate with those. We group those scenarios into collections for structured reasons. We perform pre-processing pre on data so that we can parameterize the model appropriately. We analyze the results of those models. It generates a massive number of artifacts. And coordination of those artifacts is very important for delivery of quality insights and for productivity. And the difficulties that are associated with this, of managing this tremendous complexity, can limit how much we can accomplish in the modeling process. These gaps, again, are not nuisance, simply nuisances. They impact process transparency, the confidence that stakeholders um, come to share within the modeling process, and the efficiency with which we work. Um, we're working on a system and are close to a beta release of a system to help manage the documents in this area to help provide more structure to the modeling process. And we hope that by our contribution and contributions of others uh, in building software systems, which help not only allow us to model, but to manage the modeling process, we, may, uh, we might um, arrive at a process which is more transparent and more inclusive of a wide variety of participants, giving them access. A related issue is the, issue, is the fact that the modeling process is highly ad hoc. I, I happen to be someone who teaches both software engineering, building of software artifacts for operational systems on the one hand. On the other hand, building software artifacts that are used to give modeling insight for decision making and to, to understand trends within the health area. And the contrast between these two domains could not be greater in terms of the level of attention paid retrospectively and reflectively to the, mo to the process of building these artifacts. In software engineering, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of re reflection. Some may, people may argue too much on the, the process itself, the methodologies that are put, put out and in, put into place and uh, the adoption of structured processes to help deliver software more reliably. Within modeling, we still make use of an awful lot of ad hoc processes for interacting with stakeholders, gaining an understanding of what model structure is needed, gaining confidence in models, and dealing with this welter of artifacts that, that we produce as well as integration between teams. There's a variety of techniques which are tried and true from software engineering, which I think we could bring to bear and leverage in the modeling area. These include ideas as simple as pair modeling, just like we have pair programming, the broader use of peer reviews, um, testing regimes for models, uh, risk-driven development, um, and uh, the use of incremental and adaptive delivery mechanisms for models. Thinking about the modeling process could give us better models to work with. Um, just trying to finish up here very quickly. Um, another issue is model secrecy. Um, unfortunately, we deal with the domain with, which while it deals with issues of policy, in many ways our models are closed. Closed to insight and closed to extension by others. Um, there's few models that are currently disclosed enough to allow for full reproduction. That's the, the, the real truth of the matter. And the incentives involved do not promote this. They do not promote the sharing of models. This lack of disclosure does lower our ability to critique and refine models. And I think there's, there's a potential for putting into place your funding and publication incentives that could foster a, cu a cultural shift. We are dealing with a world that's populated by people such as those for computer science who understand the virtues of open disclosure, who understand the virtues of open source mechanisms and broader community refinement. 
And I think there's a potential for a cultural shift. And I point to what happened in the bioinformatics community early on. I was doing some work in the late 90s in bioinformatics, just as the field was really getting started. And there was a real cultural shift that went on among the biologists who work with bioinformatics because their previous models had been quite closed. And they ended up coming to a, to a model of, of the domain, which, as I understand it from my colleagues working in it these days, for, um, puts tremendous emphasis on sharing and recognizes, incentivizes through cultural norms and through explicit funding and publication incentives, one, to contribute to broader, open, shared repositories. And I think there's a potential for doing this in public health modeling if we can act soon and avoid lock-in to the current model. Um, modeler training, we have a lot of... Uh, a lot of shortcomings, I think, in, in training good modelers in the public health area. This is a specialized area where um, a lot of training is, uh, is needed to become a specialist within this area. Not only methodological training, but a lot of knowledge of, of uh, the cognate disciplines. And unfortunately, as it currently stands, it's an awful ad hoc process. Frequently, people only learn one type of dynamic modeling technique. They get one hammer and they go out and look for nails. And there's incomplete knowledge of techniques in other areas. They're picked up on the street, as they were with, with me in many ways. Um, I think there's real potential here for opening up training avenues for those who are not exposed as undergraduates in engineering or mathematics or, or other STM um, programs to, to the required background for specialized training in health modeling and for exposure of modelers to courses in related disciplines that can be relevant, biostatistics, epi, and behavioral sciences. Some of the people I most respect in the dynamic modeling landscape are ones who show, frankly, shocking ignorance sometimes of biostatistics techniques. They, they haven't been exposed to this, and they don't recognize the opportunities for, for um, drawing on those techniques in their own work. And finally, I want to point a finger at the, the tribalism we do see within the health modeling landscape. This is something Diane and I have discussed. And I really think it shortchanges the potential health impacts. We have a field which is unfortunately divided in dynamic modeling for health policy along methodological lines. We have camps, people who espouse certain types of approaches to modeling that are methodologically, um, methodologically divided. And the, while the problems are held in common, there's very little interplay between the camps, very little exchange of information. It's getting better. There are attempts to bring these camps together, and I think those, um, uh, those are well warranted. But at the current time, I think it's a real challenge to, um, to effective modeling in this area. And I think um, to the degree we can build venues that help bring together people across methodological disciplines, workshops, conferences, such as the one we ran in, in July in Saskatchewan, uh, recognizing student work um, or acquiring student work with several methodologies, and potentially for contract requirements when we do um, uh, contracts for uh, agencies, making sure that cross-methodological work is done or at least is examined as a potential avenue, I think could help reduce some of the tribalism. The world is too small to allow us to engage in that without seriously shortchanging what we can accomplish. So in conclusion here, and I, I have to, uh, again, apologize for leading you in such a whirlwind way through here. Modelers cur models currently offer a lot of value in these areas. They're much needed, but we're, because of some of the barriers as uh, mentioned here, we're quite a distance from realizing the full potential of these models. And I'm hoping that by airing my thoughts on some of these some of these barriers, we may have a chance to discuss them at this workshop and elsewhere and have a chance to marshal the resources to overcome them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any question? That was a very interesting presentation and very thought provoking. Thank you. Uh, I think one of the emblematic problems with modeling is we don't even know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> when you say you're a modeling or you talk to people outside 
of your limited habit about modeling. It means all things to all people. It's a bit like saying you're an athlete without saying what sport you play. This is true. And so it's, it's, you know, one has to distinguish many different things which the field doesn't. One of them is just sophisticated from naive modeling to begin with, yep. technique-based. More adjectives are needed to actually, in my opinion, to define what one actually does. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think, uh, you know, one, we're working with an interdisciplinary audience in, in this area, both, both here and, and in uh, uh, conferences oriented towards health modeling. And um, uh, one has to recognize that to a biostatistician, a model, you know, when you say a model, it means something completely different than for someone working as an agent-based modeler. Um, if you if you talk with epidemiologists, they may have something else in mind, closer to the biostatistical uh, approaches, but uh, a little bit different, perhaps. So um, I think adjectives are are very very helpful. Um, I also think broader exposure is helpful. Um, you know, just to the the wealth of of models that are seen in these different areas. Again, I mean, there's a there's a real um, valuable set of biostatistical models that that art can articulate with dynamic models of the sort that we're discussing, but a lot of people who work in one domain don't see the other. And um, this leads to a lot of ships passing in the night, um, or worse, crashing in the night, right? Um, so I think, uh, I think there's a lot of work to be done, and I'm grateful for your comments, sir. Thank you. I also very much enjoyed your presentation. Uh, um, and I think uh, personally um, of uh, modeling very much as a means to an end, an instrument that uh, helps us enhancing uh, our understanding of a phenomenon under study. Um, now, clearly, there are, I, I don't think there is the golden way of, of how to do it, and it's important to have diversity in modeling um, in, in a uh, um, constructive way so that various modeling approaches can complement um, each other um, in in the end at the end of the day gaining uh, the best possible understanding of a problem um, but um, wh what do you think is um, is really missing here well, I mean you you addressed a number of uh, yeah. Of inconveniences, truth. Uh, truth. <laughs> um, what do you think is a better way of, of really doing it? Well, uh, it's a good question, and, and you know, I, I tried to have some slides where I give a, a hint to it, and unfortunately, the time is mm -hmm. um, limited. When it comes to um, multi-framework modeling, I, uh, you know, the issue of choice between trade offs I, I, I do believe there, there are substantive trade offs and it seems to me quite clear that there are certain broad areas where one technique will offer some really compelling advantages over other, over other techniques. And, uh, you know, far be it for me to sort of dispute that fact. I do think that the landscape of exactly where those continental divides lie and um, the understanding how best to leverage models of different sorts together, either within a single integrated framework or within a given project, I think, I think that's not quite terra incognita, but we're still really exploring that area and trying to understand um, these these trade-offs. And this is an area where I've, I've made a fair number of contributions in terms of trying to illuminate certain substantive issues that are key issues when choosing between frameworks, as well as trying to trying to recognize when some of the barriers are more in appearance than in reality. And through the use of some simple techniques, we may be able to lower some of those barriers. So I think, I think it will behoove us to recognize these trade-offs, not to recognize them as, as inherent necessarily, but so that we can work to reduce them and so we can work to, to better give guidance as to where to use one technique or another. With respect to the other barriers I've mentioned, I think all of them are surmountable. These are all things that I think in the next 10 or 15 years we're going to have to work with as a community to, to smooth out. But I think we can do it in a more painful way or a less painful way. And, um, you know, it's my hope that um, some of the research directions that I've, or priorities I've articulated there might help people uh, 
you know, recognize more explicitly that this is a problem. Because a lot of the things I've spoken about, um, you know, are not things which are widely talked about. They're just things that I've encountered as real problems in my model after model after model. And, you know, I think need to be put out there as worthy of attention. And so that's really a lot of my motivation here. But as far as the particular advice, I'd have to give it on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and it, it, you know, I don't want to... <laughs> don't want to get Diane mad. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Very good yeah. answer. Thanks. One more. Thanks. Um, so great talk. Uh, one quick question. Uh, you mentioned a bit about uh, interfacing with the public health community, mm -hmm. um, and one of the one of the big things, at least in the states, to elicit change in, in policy or, you know, to really, um, to motivate things is really interacting with the biomedical community as well. So um, what is your experience with, with uh, uh, interfacing with all three of them? Yeah. Okay, I, I could speak to that. And um, I, I count myself very fortunate to have very good relationships with both of those communities. Um, and, and this includes at the agency level. Um, so we have very close contacts, for example, with uh, Public Health Agency of Canada and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Community Acquired Infectious Disease Division there, um, uh, who have you know, turned to us to, to seek advice and insight into s causes for some of those changes, for example, in chlamydia. Um, but, uh, and, and I think at the local level, we've also found a great deal of responsiveness. Our work with the Regina Capel Health Region in the Chlamydia area being an example. Um, I do think that uh, at, at the TB level, we've also found a tremendous amount of provincially where, where there's interest in gaining insight into why TB has been so notoriously um, tricky to, to um, to deal with, particularly in recent decades, uh, circulating in our province. And, and I found tremendous openness there and in interest in models. That's not to say there's no barriers. There are. One has to strive to overcome barriers of terminology, strive to make sure that one doesn't, um, uh, you know, overwhelm sort of the, the other party with uh, the, the technical details. Um, at the biomedical level, We've, we get pulled in opposite directions in a way, just like um, so what Diane was mentioning in the discussion with Dr. Jakob on um, the issue of you know getting pulled towards representing more detail. And um, we've had to negotiate that, but some of our closest collaborators are those who are clinical practitioners who can help us understand trends, and we need to work with them in a language and at a level of abstraction that they can understand and appreciate. So we've had very good luck in this area, and maybe it's just Saskatchewan. I don't know. It's a, it's a small world out there, and, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's, there, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for collaboration which seem to open up, and um, uh, maybe, maybe there's just not enough people to go around or something. Anyway, um, thank you. For thank you very much.